You know, uh, last year we had a conference in uh, Las Vegas, and uh, we had George as one of our keynote speakers for a, a pre-conference symposium on MOOCs, and he did a great job. And of course, I've heard George speak a number of times, both in face-to-face -face and online, and always enjoy his work. And it was great to see, as I looked around, some of the work that other folks are doing here. And some of you, of course, have been real pioneers, in, like Pete and so forth, in the whole online uh, learning environment. This little talk uh, is just set up as kind of an a, a advanced organizer for the workshop that we'll do this afternoon. So I hope you can stay for the workshop. But uh, I titled this Inquiry with Impact, The Promise of Educational Design Research. And I did retire in 2010, but uh, in 2012 I wrote a book with Susan McKinney from the Open University of the Netherlands called Conducting Educational Design Research. And kind of uh, uh, decided that in my retirement I want to uh, travel around the world uh, spreading the gospel of educational design research. Now it's interesting, in uh, the States, uh, in North America in general, it's normally called design-based research. Uh, but in Europe, and we published a book in Europe with Rutledge, uh, they prefer the term educational design research. But this uh, thing, this genre of research, actually has many names. And uh, I, th I think a fellow named Jan Vandenacker at the University of Twente identified like 10 different names at this formative experiments and other names and so forth. But hopefully you'll have a sense of what it's all about and why it's important. Now, uh, this is uh, a picture uh, taken a couple weeks ago. I was in Turkey doing a workshop for the World Health Organization. I, go to, uh, I do work with the WHO quite a bit, and this was a week-long workshop on basically how to teach. Uh, and it's for physicians and pharmacists and public health officers in developing countries. And they bring them uh, to Turkey uh, because it's uh, relatively centrally located, and also relatively inexpensive to hold a, an event there. And I was just demonstrating uh, some of the different uh, roles that you can play as a uh, teacher these days. Um, this is my campus at the University of Georgia. You may not know this, but UGA is the oldest public university in the United States, founded in 1785. And uh, has the North Campus is quite beautiful, uh, has many old buildings and so forth. And in the spring, we have these lovely dogwood blossoms. Uh, I still, uh, I'm a professor emeritus, so I keep an office on campus, and I still work with doctoral students. And, uh, in this uh, picture, you can see my colleague Susan McKinney from the Netherlands, and we were having a seminar on uh, uh, design-based research or educational design research, and we have students uh, literally from all over the globe. And with the type of folks I work with in the World Health Organization, uh, uh, this was from a couple years ago, another workshop I was doing over there, but you see folks here from Iran and Iraq and Egypt, Indonesia, Brazil, uh, Chile, Thailand, lots of other places. So I uh, really enjoy doing international work. I've also uh, just uh, about uh, 11 months ago fulfilled a lifelong dream of, of doing some volunteer work in India. And uh, here I am in a little one-room school in rural India working with a former uh, PhD student, and she's involved in a project to help 70,000 teachers move from a traditional didactic role to more of a uh, learner or learning-centered role. And so I did a, uh, a, a week-long workshop on educational design research for she and her staff there. Uh, so what do we hope to accomplish in this little session? Well, uh, we'll uh, I'd like to challenge some assumptions you might have about educational research in general, and particularly educational technology research, and uh, raise some questions and hopefully promote some change, some maybe a change your mental model of what research in education uh, should be. Um, and specifically, I, I would like to uh, critique the educational technology research we have today, and this is something that I have uh, uh, been doing for at least 25 years. In, uh, it's like banging your head against the wall sometimes, 
but uh, I also want to argue for moving educational technology research from a focus on things to more of a focus on problems, and then present a case study of educational design research uh, that I did with, uh, that I am doing actually with the World Health Organization. If you have questions or comments or uh, at any time, please uh, let me know and we'll address those right away. So to start off, educational technology research. Uh, it can be summed up in the words, no significant differences, uh, unfortunately. Um, I used to be the editor of one of these journals and, and I'm sure that there are people in this room that have published in these journals. They come out every quarter uh, and they're full of uh, studies that when those studies are entered into a literature review or a meta-analysis often come up with no significant differences. A great source to see this is a book by John Hattie. John Hattie used to be the Dean of the Faculty of Education at the University of Auckland. Now he uh, has an endowed professorship at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in Australia. But in this book, Visible Learning, he did this, um, he and his graduate students did this incredible meta-analysis, probably the largest one ever done in education. And they tried to tease out 135 different variables that influence learning in schools. They primarily were focused on K-12 education, but I think we could generalize from some of these factors to higher education as well. So uh, don't have room to show you all 135 variables, but here are uh, 10 of the variables. Uh, so formative evaluation to teachers, teacher clarity, uh, <clears throat> feedback to students, problem-solving teaching, mastery learning, computer-assisted instruction, simulations, web-based learning, distance education, and television. So he, for the meta-analysis, he was trying to reduce uh, hundreds and thousands of studies to what's called an effect size. An effect size of one would indicate one standard deviation improvement and achievement over one uh, treatment over another. And so what do you think are the most, uh, uh, the strongest variables here? Well, it's interesting. Here's the data. And uh, Hattie argues that anything uh, under 0.4 isn't worth worrying about. You shouldn't even bother with it, okay? Uh, so you see the variables that count, that really make a difference in learning, are things like giving teachers formative evaluation on how they're doing as teachers feedback to students, uh, mastery learning, holding students to a high standard for learning. The things that show no significant differences basically are the things that we in educational technology are most concerned about. Computer-assisted instruction, simulations, web-based learning, distance education, and television. So basically what that amounts to is that if you're comparing uh, these types of things um, that we have here, um, so the, I guess that doesn't show up on the screen, does it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, if you, these things down here, if you're comparing these things to traditional instruction, you don't get much of a difference. Uh, but if you introduce better ways of providing formative information to teachers, you do get some impact. Uh, this has been uh, summarized in a lot of different resources. Uh, Thomas Russell uh, looked at the literature from 1928 to 2008, every type of distance learning, uh, starting back with the correspondence schools and up to today's e-learning. And again, he found that when course materials and teaching methodology are held constant, there's no significant difference. And why would there be? You're not changing anything fundamental. You're not changing the instructional design. You're not changing the pedagog pedagogical dimensions you're only changing the delivery method. Now, my old professor, uh, Richard Clark, that I had five courses with, Dick Clark from University of Southern California, I had five courses with him at Syracuse University back in the 70s. And he uh, says that expecting technology to impact learning is like expecting the truck that delivers your food to impact the nutrition of the food. It's the quality of the food, the, um, 
that actually affects your nutritional value, not necessarily the truck or the train or the plane that uh, brought it there. Technology does not impact learning directly. Another analogy that I prefer is uh, to think about a pain reliever like aspirin. Uh, if you have a headache, you can take an aspirin in many different media. It can be a tablet, a capsule, a chewing gum, uh, and uh, different ways of getting it. Some might be easier to swallow, some might be more cost effective, a little cheaper, uh, and so forth. But uh, it's really the acid compound that's in the aspirin that relieves your pain. You can get that acid compound into your bloodstream in multiple ways, multiple media, if you will. Uh, and so, oh, I guess it does show on the screen. Uh, and um, so the media doesn't have a direct impact on relieving your pain. The acid compound does. With respect to educational technologies, it's the methods, the instructional methods, the pedagogical dimensions that have a direct impact on learning, not the media per se. And yet some people persist in thinking that if we could just get the right technology into the classroom, everything will be fundamentally changed. And there, of course, uh, iPads is one of the things that a lot of people get excited about or any type of tablet computer. And, you know, they're wanting to, you know, basically, uh, I guess, uh, have pregnant mothers swallow uh, tablet computers, you know, get the kid interacting in the uterus or something. But, I mean, earlier and earlier, <laughs> providing kids with technology. And the, and the uh, federal government uh, is arguing for this. Uh, uh, a couple years ago, on the, uh, the first annual Digital Learning Day, which sounds like a great thing, uh, the Secretary of Education and the head of the FCC, uh, they announced a plan to replace all textbooks with uh, online or, or um, e-books that would be delivered through iPads and so forth. And another, uh, a number of other countries have announced similar types of things. Somehow thinking that if you can take the textbook and put it on the device, learning is going to be magically transformed. This belief has been around for a long time. Uh, Thomas Edison, when he uh, was interviewed by the New York Times, in uh, 1919, we're talking uh, almost 100 years ago, uh, he basically said that within 10 years, uh, films, he was, of course, had a financial interest in this, as many of the proponents of t educational technologies do. He argued that within 10 years, all of uh, the books would be replaced with films and that children would be so excited they would run to school and just couldn't wait to get there and so forth. Uh, of course, that didn't happen. Uh, and then in the 1930s, uh, Presley, uh, a psychologist, uh, wrote a book called Psychology in a New Education. And you he, think about this now. This is 1933, so this is quite a long time ago. Uh, we're talking, uh, uh, you know, during the Great Depression. And uh, you, but you see the same language today, whether it's talking about iPads in the classroom or MOOCs and so forth. There must be an industrial revolution. That's the favorite word of proponents of educational technology, revolution in education, in which educational science and the ingenuity of educational technology combine to modernize the grossly inefficient and clumsy procedures of conventional education. He went on to say that, and I, I don't like to read long quotes, but I think this is important because, you know, it's so reminiscent of what we hear today with respect to other things. You know, work in the schools of the future will be marvelously uh, uh, through simply, though simply organized, so as to adjust almost automatically to individual differences in the characteristics of the learning process. There will be many labor-saving schemes and devices, and even machines, uh, not at all for the mechanizing of education, no, 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 but for the freeing of teacher and pupil from educational drudgery and incompetence. Uh, that's another message that these people tell about educational technology is going to you know, get rid of those incompetent teachers. So what did that machine look like, the Presley teaching machine? There it is, you know, 
imagine sitting there. Well, I actually experienced this kind of thing in the 1950s. I was born in 1947, and we had a thing called programmed instruction. Now, the ones I used were not on machines. They were actually in paper books, and you had to have these little special markers, and you turn from page to page. But it didn't revolutionize education then, and it's not going to revolutionize education now. And yet, we're filling our schools up at every level. You can travel anywhere in the world, and they're you know, saying we need to have uh, tablets, we need to have laptops, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's big economic interest behind these things. Now, here's a class at my university, University of Georgia. And you, you know, you see here, uh, the students all have their uh, various laptops going on here, and the person's using PowerPoint to give a great lecture. But what's really going on? Well, uh, this person is shopping uh, uh, over here. This person's doing a crossword puzzle. I didn't make this up, by the way. Uh, this one's on Facebook. This one's falling asleep. So, you know, again, if you don't change the instructional methods, why would you ex expect any difference? This was a study uh, conducted at the University of Pennsylvania earlier this year that got a lot of publicity. Uh, and uh, they basically compared uh, learners who took notes on paper with learners who took notes on, with laptops or tablets. And they found that people who use paper actually learn more in, uh, than the students who use the technology. Now, they explained that. Uh, it was interesting how they explained that. They said that the students who were uh, writing on paper couldn't keep up with the uh, lecture as much as those with the technology. And so they were actually having to think about what the lecturer was saying and recode that and write down their own notes. And so they were actually processing the material as the lecturer spoke. Whereas the students who had the technology were trying to capture everything verbatim that learning was going through their fingers, but not through their brains. At least that was their explanation. So I kind of jokingly uh, put a comment uh, on their website that said, well, you know, you need to set up a new study where you compare students taking notes uh, by hand with students taking notes with a written stylus on a, <laughs> on a tablet. But they haven't uh, taken me up on that. So what we have, then, is a legacy of no significant differences when it comes to educational technology. And so how do we reform this? How do we change this state of affairs? Uh, we've had decades of research, and some people have been quite prolific in publishing. Uh, probably the person that uh, has been more prolific than anyone I know of is Professor Richard Mayer at uh, University of California at Austin. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> University of California at San, Santa Barbara. Uh, but look at his uh, Google Scholar. I just uh, got this a couple of days ago. So he's been cited in the literature um, about uh, almost 65,000 times, uh, 34,000 times since 2009 has an H index of 113. Uh, I mean, we're getting up into uh, uh, just unbelievable <laughs> numbers here. And he's, uh, of course, published a lot of books as well. Uh, one of the best known is uh, e-learning in the science of instruction. Uh, and uh, that's another theme you see in some of this educational technology work. Now, I know. Uh, Richard, and he's a, a very good scholar and has done really good research. And, uh, but the problem is nobody applies his research. So he's actually uh, uh, reduced his many years of research to 12 uh, what he calls multimedia learning principles. And they're things like uh, the coherence principle. People learn better when extraneous words, pictures, and sounds are excluded rather than included. Okay? Redundancy principle. People learn better from graphics and narration than from graphics, narration, and on-screen text. Modality principle. People learn better from graphics and narrations than from animation and on-screen text. Image principle. People do not necessarily learn better from a multimedia lesson when the speaker's image is added to the screen. So there are eight more of these principles. And you would think you would see these applied 
whenever people uh, develop uh, e-learning or online learning or MOOCs, for example, uh, MOOCs, of course, are the most important educational technology in 200 years, at least according to uh, the MIT Technology Review, uh, and uh, they promoted this idea a couple years ago. And, of course, MIT is one of the major players in edX, um, and one of the big initiatives in the MOOC world. But what happens when you actually take, uh, you enroll in a MOOC? I enrolled in, I've enrolled probably in 15 or 20 MOOCs uh, over the last couple of years, and most of them with Coursera. And so here is one I enrolled in called Foundations of Virtual Instruction. And here's a screen capture from that. Okay, so you have this uh, woman on the screen talking to you. And by the way, she has a little dog behind her. I, she always had this little dog sitting behind her, which, which was kind of... I actually found myself watching the dog more than her most of the time. Uh, but then she has another uh, image up here of the term she's talking about. And then she's basically... These are her bullet points that she's going down through. And, of course, this totally violates Mayer's coherence principle. Throws it right out the window. Uh, and then here's another one. This is a great course I enrolled in from the University of Wisconsin uh, on uh, game-based uh, uh, video games and learning. And uh, here's one of their screens. You see uh, the famous James G. here speaking. Uh, very high production values. But meanwhile, while he's speaking, there's this animation going on over here. And the animation and what he's speaking about really aren't aligned very well at all. So this vi val violates the image principle that uh, Mayer talked about. Uh, here's one more. Uh, this was from a, probably the most interesting MOOC I've taken. It was on comic books and graphic novels, just something I've been interested in. And it was from the University of Colorado Boulder. It was taught by a classics professor. Really interesting. But again, here's a screen capture from one of his uh, uh, lessons. And uh, he literally was reading all of this material here to us while there was this comic book page over here and this picture uh, of uh, Maurice Sendak over there and so forth. And of course, it violates Mayer's redundancy principle. Uh, part of the problem I see with uh, so if, if educational technology research, the best educational technology research that can be reduced to a set of 12 principles are there and no one's applying them, is it worth doing? Um, and I could show the same thing in e-learning courses, online courses, and so forth, not just picking on MOOCs. I think part of the problem, a lot of people involved in this have a reduced, uh, a really reductionist mental model of what learning is. They in fact, people like Paul Kirshner and John Sweller and uh, even my old professor Dick Clark, they, they speak as if the only thing that amounts in learning is a change in long-term memory. And they seem to have a mental model of learning as you know, the brain being some sort of giant organic filing cabinet that you push information into and, and then you have to come up with some sort of retrieval system. But I think uh, you know, we, we've come to a point now where we recognize that learning is much more complex. Learning is in the world. Learning is not in our minds. It's in the world. It's in our exchanges with people and in other information sources. It's very, very complex. And it can't be reduced to a simple matter of just changing your memory registers in your brain. So I think that so much of what we've done in educational technology research, whether it's this no significant differences problem or it's these, you know, reduced principles of instructional design or multimedia design, uh, you know, they really haven't had much impact. And the only defensible rationale for educational technology research is impact on real world problems. And you don't see that enough. And that's because so much of the research is focused on things. What's the latest thing? And we can go back decades and see this again and again. So today, if you look at the uh, journals that I put up there before, you're going to see studies about iPads and tablets, mobile learning, online learning, 3D printers. Um, by the way, I just Googled uh, 
a couple of days ago, 3D printers and learning. And I saw three headlines that came up and said, 3D printing will revolutionize engineering education. Uh, anyway, uh, games and simulations, wearable technology, smartphones, machine learning, virtual assistants, immersive learning, all this research focused on things. We need to do research focused on problems. We need to, and this is one of the benefits of educational design research. It starts with a significant educational problem, a significant world challenge, ineffective teaching perhaps, inadequate higher order learning, lack of motivation and engagement among learners. The fact that so many of our graduates graduate unprepared for the world of work or lifestyle, uh, lack of intellectual curiosity, undeveloped creativity, weak communication skills, insufficient time on task. Uh, another myth that educational technologists tell again and again is that technology makes learning easy and fun. Learning's not easy. Learning can be fun, can be enjoyable, but it's not easy. It takes effort. It, it takes time on task to develop meaningful learning. So we need a more socially responsible research agenda focused on problems that matter. You know, things like uh, dropout rates. I don't know what the high school completion rate is in Texas, uh, but in Georgia, it's 52%. The national average is 70%. 52% of students complete high school in four years in Georgia. That's unacceptable. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, Teachers, uh, my friend Kurt Bonk's in Singapore today, and I've done a, some work down there. And, uh, you know, they always hold Singapore and Korea up as the, uh, and Finland as these countries that really their students achieve very well, but they have great teachers. You cannot get into teacher education in Singapore unless you graduate in the top 25% of your high school class. That's not true here, as you know. Um, uh, or uh, STEM education, you know, science, math, engineering, and uh, technology. We're not doing such a good job in those areas either. Or we could look to the United Nations Millennial, Millennium Goals. Unfortunately, these were established 15 years ago, and uh, you can see they're supposed to be uh, completed by uh, the year tw 2015. Well, that's next year, so we're not going to do that. Uh, we're not going to eradicate poverty around the world or hunger or, uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, the case study that I'm now going to present to you really was focused on one of these goals, and it was all about uh, combating uh, disease uh, in uh, developing countries. So uh, we've seen that uh, educational technology research largely reduced to no significant differences. There's a big need for reforming educational technology research, and I think educational, techno educational research in general. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, here's a little case study. This uh, case study uh, just finished co-supervising uh, the uh, PhD work of this fellow, Jim Vesper. He's from Rochester, New York, and he's actually a world's expert on good manufacturing uh, practices for pharmaceuticals. He's literally written books on this. But a few years ago, he said to me, you know, I really need to get a PhD. I, I've always wanted one. I just haven't had time. He said, I don't have time to go back to normal graduate school. And I said, well, you know, I work a lot with Jan Harrington in Australia. She's at Murdoch University. And uh, you can actually enroll in her PhD program and do your coursework at a distance and uh, work with, you know, and I'll work with her uh, on uh, co-supervising your research. So Jim thought that was a great idea, and we set that up. And uh, so Jim used uh, educational design research. This is the little book that was published in uh, 2012. And he applied this model, and uh, won't go through this in a lot of detail, but Basically, with educational design research, you have a problem. In Jim's case, the problem, I'll get, get into more detail, but the problem involved perishable vaccines and how do you manage the cold chain for vaccines. The cold chain 
is the notion that vaccines have to be kept at a temperature between 2 and 8 degrees centigrade. If they get too cold, they're frozen. If they get too warm, they're ruined. And uh, it happens a lot, particularly in developing countries, that these vaccines aren't well managed. And of course, then they don't have the effects they need to have and so forth. So with educational design research, you start with a phase of analysis and exploration of the problem. And you need to work very closely with the people who own the problem. In this case, it was people at the World Health Organization and people in developing countries charged with maintaining the cold chain for vaccines. Then you go through a phase of design and construction of a prototype learning environment to address that problem. That prototype might or might not include technology. Uh, it really depends on the nature of the problem and the needs of the people involved. And then you go, and what's wrong with this model, it doesn't really show very well that you go through iterative stages of refinement through formative evaluation, evaluation and reflection to improve the treatment, but also tease out new knowledge about the nature of the problem and how it could be solved. And in the end, ideally, you have a mature intervention and new theoretical understanding, usually in the form of reusable design principles. And you're also attending to implementation and spread of this along the way. So to give a little more uh, information about this, <clears throat> uh, again, you work closely with practitioners that, and define a pedagogical outcome that will address the problem. And then you develop a, a prototype sort of problem, uh, again, using the best theoretical knowledge that's out there to do literature reviews and so forth, but also the most the creative uses of whatever area you're working in, technology or what have you, and lots of effort uh, involved as well. You emphasize content and pedagogy rather than technology alone. So you're not throwing iPads over the walls of the classroom and expecting things to change. You're really dealing, how do we change both the content and the pedagogy? give special attention to supporting human interactions. Uh, you test, refine, and retest the learning environment until the outcome is reached. And, and usually that takes at least three iterations of testing and refinement. And then you refine the theory, the design principles, at the same time. So again, this problem with the cold chain is a worldwide problem. Uh, particularly in developing countries where vaccines are often administered to children or, or adults that have been ruined by either uh, getting too warm or, or, or being frozen and so forth. And it makes those vaccines ruined and they don't, don't have the effects they need to have. So uh, the World Health Organization to address this problem for the last 10 years, they have had a, one course a year ca affectionately called cold chain management on wheels and they bring in folks from developing countries and put them on a bus and drive them through Turkey so that they can see what the cold chain looks like in practice and uh, in Turkey has a really good system for managing the cold chain for vaccines and I've been on this bus and it's a, a really exciting adventure but uh, uh, two years ago, three years ago, uh, when Jim wanted to start his PhD, I kind of casually mentioned to the, my uh, main contact at the World Health Organization, I said, you know, we could, we could put this bus course online. And he said, what? And I said, you know, I, well, the way you're doing it now, you can only afford to do it once a year. You can only take 15 people on the bus. And, you know, you've told me that you've got hundreds and hundreds of people that need this course we could put this course online. So that was the challenge that Jim, through his dissertation, took on. <clears throat> and so, you know, people uh, get on the bus, and uh, uh, in June I was on the bus. Here's uh, the folks that were on the bus with me in June. Uh, and you see uh, the uh, folks in this particular bus course were mainly from sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we had some from Malaysia and uh, couple other countries as well. <clears throat> and, um, and then we had a number of, of mentors as well. 
Uh, Jim was uh, actually supposed to be on the bus, but he got uh, uh, ill and wasn't able to come, so we just brought him in via Skype. But we travel uh, across the country and uh, visiting various sites where vaccines are managed, starting at a large port city, Izmir, seeing how the vaccines are brought in from France or wherever they're manufactured, how they're stored there, eventually getting down to little local public health centers or pharmacies and so forth. Every day on the bus, we go over our objectives and talk about what um, they uh, <coughs> Uh, were going to do that day, what they were going to see. At each site they visit, they actually uh, do an analysis of the good things they see there and the things that they see that could be improved. And during the whole week, their goal is to come up with a better cold chain management plan for uh, their own country. Because uh, usually these people are at a fairly high level. They're in charge of managing a region of Nigeria or Ghana or Indonesia, wherever it might be. Every night on the bus, we stop at a restaurant or a cafe, and we set up a little classroom, and people present ideas about, they work in small teams and present ideas about what they saw, what they think needs improvement, and, and so forth. And again, as I mentioned, we get right down to the local level of actually seeing people uh, get the vaccine. Now this type of learning, I'm sure you're familiar with, is what's called experiential learning. Uh, Cobb's model of experiential learning, basically you need to have some sort of concrete experience, which uh, traveling down the cold chain provides. You need to involve yourself in reflective observations and then abstract conceptualizations based on those observations. Usually this is done uh, collaboratively uh, and then active experimentation with new ideas and then you go through that cycle multiple times. So what we were ch challenged with in the study, the educational design research then, was to try to replicate the experience of being on the bus in an e-learning environment. So we started off by doing some design work in Antalya, Turkey about three years ago. And you can see uh, here uh, Umit uh, uh, is a physician with the World Health Organization in Geneva. Uh, myself, Jim Vesper, the doctoral student who was doing this for his dissertation, and then Gohan is uh, from the production company in Turkey that actually produced the course based on our design. And the design was based on another book I wrote a few years ago called A Guide to Authentic E-Learning with Jan Harrington and Ron Oliver. And that mo this um, model basically has uh, a number of principles again, and uh, we're short on time, so I'm not going to go through these uh, <clears throat> in a lot of detail. But the basic idea is that you engage people in authentic task. In this case, the authentic task is to uh, deal with real-world problems in the cold chain uh, and provide uh, on these authentic tasks, have the opportunity to uh, observe expert performances in the modeling of the processes to provide multiple roles and perspectives to support collaborative construction of knowledge, um, pro uh, promote reflection, uh, and then have people uh, actually, uh, this is based on Seymour Pack Papert's constructionism principle, but people actually have to create an artifact that represents their new knowledge, that in a sense, represents their new knowledge. Uh, and those, uh, you provide coaching and scaffolding along the way by mentors. And then the assessment is built right into the task. It's not like you do this work and then you get take a test. The assessment is involved in the task. So based on uh, the research we were doing in this model, we built a course, and, and uh, I hope you'll, I, I've given a link to these uh, slides in PDF, and you can go to the link for this course. You can take a look at it. But we call it uh, authentic uh, e-learning. And uh, anytime you build a learning environment, I don't care whether it's a face-to-face -face course or a MOOC that's going to have 50,000 learners, there are certain variables that have to be carefully aligned. Learning objectives. And those learning objectives obviously can range from very discrete uh, lower order objectives to 
higher order objectives like mental models and that sort of thing. Uh, your nature of your content, uh, some content deals with one right answer, uh, but other content deals with multiple perspectives. There's no one right way to handle a cold chain because the, the cold chain is influenced by the environment in which it's being instantiated. And so you're trying to manage a cold chain in the jungles of Vietnam versus the uh, plains of Turkey. It's very different factors and so forth. The instructional design could involve direct instruction or perhaps this idea of experiential learning. The nature of the task. Are the tasks academic, abstract tasks, or are they more authentic, real-world tasks? The role of the teacher or the facilitator, is it you know, lecturing, delivering content, or is it more of a mentor, a guide, a facilitator? Um, the role of the technology. Uh, is it to provide some sort of prepackaged tutorial, which might be useful in some context, or is it used for communication and, and uh, 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 collaboration among learners or simulations and things like that? And finally, the nature of the assessment. Are you just trying to assess uh, discrete knowledge using, uh, say, a multiple choice test, or are you trying to get at a complex mental model where the knowledge representation might take uh, the form of a plan for a developing country managing its cold chain. So how do we implement this in the course? Well, for our objectives, we're mainly on the higher order type of objectives. Uh, and uh, you can see those displayed here. Uh, and this is a screen from the course. And for, it's a 12-week course, uh, so we've reduced a one uh, a seven day on the bus course to a 12 week course because the people who are now enrolled in the course are wor working full time and uh, in their various areas. But for the first eight weeks of the 12 week course, they travel around the same places that we would go in Turkey, but they're traveling vicariously. And at each of these places, they're given a facility tour, there's 360 degree photographs and movies, and they can see the site uh, just as if they were there, uh, but they're given similar problems. They're looking for problems and ways things could be improved. In the last four weeks of the course, they actually uh, are uh, solving a real-world problem. Every time we run the online version, a country submits its prop cold chain problems to us. This uh, time, we're running it right now, we're using Albania as sending, has sent a number of problems. So the folks work together collaboratively on these problems. Um, and here you see uh, a typical uh, course. We uh, typically have 15 to 24 learners in a course. And you see, like, here's a fellow from uh, Russia working with someone from Sri Lanka, working with someone from India. So that's one team. Here's a team, somebody from Cuba, somebody from the States, and somebody from Ghana working together as a team. So the collaboration is very, very important. Um, and we use Google Docs where they uh, you know, present the information that they're working on, these various problems and so forth, and share that. Uh, we use Skype and we use, in some cases, like with the Cuban students, we actually uh, can't use a lot of the tools we can with other countries, so we have to find other means. Um, and the mentors, uh, people, this is, uh, again, Jim, the guy that was doing his PhD. He's one of the mentors, not in the, only on the real bus course, but also in the, the virtual bus course, and uh, provide lots of opportunities to interact with them. Uh, we also have a number of uh, simulations in the course. Uh, one of the things you can do with a, if you have a, a vial of vaccine that you suspect might be frozen, you can take a, another vial of vaccine that you know hasn't been frozen, and you can hold those two together, and you can shake them. And then you watch the sentiment fall to the bottom and sediment. And by watching that, you can figure out whether the vaccine has been frozen or not, and whether it's any good. And so we have simulations of that. And then finally, as I mentioned, uh, in the bus course, uh, they are solving real-world problems every day. In the virtual course, the last four weeks of the 12-week course, they work on problems for another country to improve their 
cold chain system for vaccines. Uh, so here again, the design of the course, then you can see we've, we've actually uh, tried to implement an authentic learning environment where all of these things are carefully aligned. Um, so uh, at the end of this course, uh, we, uh, when the bus course, and I've been on the bus course, at the end of the course, we give people prizes and certificates and things. And literally, people get very emotional and they cry at this ceremony. They've spent a very intense week together traveling through Turkey and so forth, and they cry. Um, one of the things we haven't succeeded in the e-learning course is getting people to cry. But we'll know that we're really authentic when we can get them to cry. So the bottom line is don't waste your life. Do educational design research. Thank you. It's exactly 1 o'clock, so we're back on time. <laughs> I know I rushed through that a little bit. But. You have a bit of time for questions, so uh, go ahead. Okay, so hi, um, I'm Peggy. Hi, Peggy. Back in your second slide, you had the list of 10 things and the effect sizes, um, and I think feedback stood out to me because, to me, I see some, some educational tools that help children learn. You okay? Broadly, you know, peer to meet assistant learning tools that these can be pretty interactive, like responsive and adaptive learning, mm -hmm. but couldn't infer, like, couldn't technology include feedback? Oh, so, absolutely. And that's the thing, that's though. That's, yeah, absolutely. So you can uh, provide a child with a device like this, and if it has well designed interactions that would provide uh, developmental feedback, absolutely. If the problem is people sometimes give you a device like that and they put a lecture on it and expect things to miraculously be better than the classroom lecture. Why would it be? It's still a lecture. Lecture is a lecture. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If you can integrate really good uh, learning designs that would include lots of feedback on meaningful tasks, personalized to that learner, absolutely, I agree. You can, you can get good results. Um, absolutely. Yes? Can you say anything about technology for teaching children who might not have, um, let's say, you know, English if they're in the United States as a first language, or children who have difficulty in reading because of dyslexia, yeah. or any kind of uh, difficulties, educational differences? How can we make technology more appropriate for those like, Population. Yeah, there's a new book out uh, called uh, Design Based Research in Call uh, Computer Aided Language Learning. Uh, and uh, Susan McKinney and I have a chapter in that book. Uh, it's published by Calico, which is the organization that deals with uh, computer based language learning. Anyway, uh, I think uh, that you could really. Uh, apply educational design research to challenges like that, uh, working with ESL learners or uh, any kind of special needs learners and so forth. Absolutely. And I think there are a lot of technological affordances that can help folks in that, uh, that face those types of challenges. Absolutely. And you talked about that in your chapter? Yes, we do, as a matter of fact. Yep. What's the book called? It's called Design Based Research in Call. Call being an acronym for computer aided language learning. Yes. This morning I was talking to a school district. They have, by my, all of the high schools except five large high schools have received a one to one iPad. And you hear the, the kind of background noise about, they just don't know how to use those iPads, but all the kids have them, and so they're mm -hmm. banging and they do. And now all of the
Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree, and I hope that if there are any doctoral students in the room, and I know there are a couple at least, um, that, you know, they will look for those types of opportunities, because it used to be that, you know, well, you wanted to do this type of research, but the technology was so expensive, it wasn't available. Well, now it's ubiquitous, as you say, but we haven't invested in the teacher training. We haven't really redefined how we're going to change teaching uh, and learning uh, in ways that uh, uh, take advantage of the affordances of these technologies. So there's a wonderful opportunity there for educational design research. So we definitely will focus on some of that this afternoon, Diane, absolutely.